Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our event today. We're pretty excited to have that event running with by Alberta today. Um, my name is Mira and I am part of the Edmonton Science to Business uh, chapter and I'll be the moderator for today's event. Um, just a little bit about science to business and who we are. Uh, so our organization, um, like our mission is basically to foster a culture of innovation uh, within and around the research and healthcare communities. Uh, so we're hoping to uh, improve training of graduate students through career development, development events that are hosted um, and enhance commercialization mentality. And of course, by um, linking those who are in academia, such as yourselves, with people from government industry and other uh, areas and other careers. Uh, and we hope that through our events, you might be able to build your network and connect with others to learn about to learn about different career paths that would fit you. And of course, with the series that we're hosting uh, right now in March, uh, we're hoping to help you set up for success, as we say, is um, to be able to build your resume, what to do in an interview and things like that. Uh, we are a national organization. Uh, we have many chapters throughout Canada. Most of our chapters are in, in Ontario, but uh, we have our Winnipeg chapter and of course our Edmonton chapter here. Uh, and we're always looking for volunteers. So if you're interested, please send us an email. Uh, and I would first like to introduce you to our team here in Edmonton. Uh, so Quinn and I are co-presidents for that chapter. And we have a fantastic team um, that helps bring those events to you. Um, and if would be more than happy to connect with you. So please reach out. Um, and here's our contact information. So you can look at uh, our website, the Science to Business website um, for more information about events that are happening. And of course, because everything is virtual now, um, you can attend events that are run by many other chapters. So uh, take advantage of that while you can, I guess. Um, and of course, um, please follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook uh, and other social media, uh, uh, Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I wanted to bring to your attention uh, the early professionals hub for science to business. And it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty great way to meet different mentors. Uh, so um, that network basically there is a, a mentor that comes on every two weeks and they talk about their career on on LinkedIn uh, and you can ask them questions or you can connect with them and know more about their career path. Okay, um, and I would also like to bring your attention to the podcast that's been launched earlier last year by uh, Dr. Bruce, Bruce Seat, who's the founder and president of the Science to Business um, organization. Uh, I would highly encourage you to listen to the podcast. It's, I've, I've listened to them and they're pretty amazing. Uh, and he hosts different speakers and you can of course find them uh, available on different podcast platforms. Okay. Um, and another thing that I'd like to bring your attention to is the Science to Business Academy, which is a sort of a spin-off uh, from the Science to Business Network. Uh, and they partner with different organizations to provide training sessions and different courses to help you with your career. Uh, and there is an upcoming course that they're hosting or that they're um, bringing forth. Uh, in June 2021. Um, and this upcoming course is basically a course that tells you about the pharma industry. And it's over four weeks, two hours each week. Uh, and it's a great course and it covers a lot of information about the pharma industry from like structure, organization, regulation, reimbursement, um, and communication with healthcare professionals and patients. Uh, and I personally took that course last year and it truly taught me a lot about what goes behind the scenes of the pharma industry. And especially as someone that has not been in that industry and I don't know yet how it works. Uh, so it did give me a great understanding of uh, the operations and also the different careers that go on. Um, and during actually the last session, which is week four, uh, you get the chance to network with um, many, like multiple CEOs of big, uh, pharma companies and fantastic leaders uh, in the field of pharma. So it's a pretty great course if you're interested. Uh, and you can find it in 
uh, s2ba.org. And with that, I would like to thank our partner for this uh, event uh, by Alberta. Um, and I'll let Trish talk to you a little bit about by Alberta. Thanks very much, Mira. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> just so uh, if, if, if any of you weren't here with us last time, because we had a, a fun session just before Christmas, um, I'll let you know that Bio Alberta is the India industry association um, focused on life sciences, which includes both biotech and health technology. Um, we're a member driven and member funded uh, uh, agency, and we currently sit at about 188 members. Our goal is to create, expand the network to connect small companies, researchers, and startups with the supports and guidance that they need, whether it be policy, regulatory, or funding, or finding parts of the supply chain. We take pride in being able to navigate that ecosystem and to connect our members to the people they need to grow and be successful. And in and amongst that is organizations like the Science to Business Network. And we're very fond of, uh, of, of, of the, the team that uh, um, Mira and Quinn have assembled here. Um, and we're so excited about this series. And we're so thrilled that Andrea is able to join us today to teach you all how to do a really good job at putting together a resume because there's summer jobs that are just around the corner. And I'll, I'll just put a plug in now. Um, there is a section on the Bio Alberta website um, that's called Boosting Biotech. And we have over 40 opportunities that are coming forward here for summer interns. Those will be loaded up onto that website here within probably about seven days. They'll also be shared across different platforms like the University of Alberta has a, a career center and they're able to share those job postings. Um, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm quite sure that there's some in there that might be of interest to some of the folks that are watching here today. And with that in mind, I'm going to turn it back to Mira and Mira will do a, a good job introducing Andrea. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Trish. Um, so as Trish mentioned, this is actually our second event of the Setup for Success series with resume writing. Uh, and as like Andrea Diocampo is going to be talking to us today, and it's my greatest pleasure to introduce her today. Uh, she's fantastic. Uh, and she's also, uh, she was an, a U of A alumni. So uh, mm -hmm. for those who are in U of A, <laughs> uh, and just over five years of experience in different capacities. And as she mentioned, her career started with a fantastic resume and a well done resume. So in her current role right now as staffing manager with an international firm, uh, she knows what companies are looking for and can advise um, those who are seeking jobs uh, to and let them know what they can do to set apart the resumes and we're very excited to have her today with us. Thank you so much Andrea. Thank you. And I'll Mary stop my sharing. <laughs> yeah thank you for the lovely introduction and and Trish for inviting me as well. You know resume and your cover letter those are your tickets to your foot in the door in your first job. They are very very important. In my current role right now as a staffing manager I meet with hundreds and hundreds of candidates from different, um, different backgrounds and experience. My focus is administration and HR, but these are all transferable tips that you can take regardless of what industry you're planning to go to or start your career in. This is your gateway to your career. So I'm happy to be able to share my screen and go through you know, what to look out for and essentially how to craft a really strong resume. So bear with me while I go in here and share my screen. Let me know when you can see a nicely formatted um, presentation. Yes, it's all good. We can see Perfect. it. <laughs> yeah, so some of you may know how to write a resume and some may not. It really is a craft that you learn that I wish more schools um, you know, teach, but I'm here today to change that. So I'm here from Robert Half Canada and we are a placement agency. So on a daily basis, we you know change people's lives by getting them jobs in the accounting and finance space, in the administration and HR space, in the IT and technology space as well. Uh, to give you a reference, I help people get jobs. Last week, I, I, I placed 12 candidates. So that's 12 different jobs started by 12 different people. So as you know, resume is your first impression with any organization. It's your shot at impressing the hiring manager and 
your gateway into getting that interview, right? So we need to make sure that this is crafted really well before anything else. So it only takes two minutes. Let me tell you, I look at so many resumes, even for just one job posting. And in this case, you know, it only takes two minutes. So you want to make sure that it's um, easy to understand. You're using the keywords that you see in the job posting, that it's complete and it's customizable. Um, generic resumes don't really get good responses. So you want to, again, customize where suitable to the role at hand. So like I said, something that's easy to understand, keyword rich, complete, and you customize it. There's a few words that have been shown to, I guess, increase your chances of being seen by a hiring manager. And these are action verbs, because when you write out your resume, you know, you're essentially describing what you've done, either in school, for a not-for-profit organization, for companies, for assignments. And the biggest thing that you want to refrain from doing is saying I, because they already know it's coming from you, right? The resume basically has your name at the top. So instead of saying I, you can use words like planned. What did you plan? What problem did you resolve? So I so resolved, surpassed, navigated, negotiated, composed. When you are in the process of figuring out, okay, what words do I want to use on my resume to describe what I've done? I highly recommend, you know, bringing up a virtual uh, thesaurus <laughs> or a dictionary to figure out, okay, what words will stand out? But those are some of them. Now, in terms of choosing which kind of resume, there's different types. There's the three most popular, and that's your chronological resume, your functional resume, and the combination of the two. So in terms of choosing which one to go with, it's highly dependent on where you're at in the stage of your career. So for chronological resumes, these are the ones where you start off with your most recent experience, and then go reverse. So, okay, this is my most recent one, then this is the next most recent one, so on and so forth. And this works really well when you're more established or you've gained more opportunities. As a student, great uh, equivalent work experiences would be practicum placements, internships, um, extra projects that you've done for school that you know, you did, you went the extra mile and you're very passionate about the work that you've done, that counts. That is experience because you're not just reading from your book, digesting the knowledge and doing tests. You have that experience to share. So I would capitalize on those for sure in your academic career. So that's the chronological resume. So essentially it's showcasing what you've accomplished, your experiential learning, and um, you want it to be curated so it focuses on what you're applying to. And so that's what the functional resume is for as well um, now, or chronological, sorry. So now for the functional resume, this is more so if you are an entry level job seeker, which a lot of new grads are, or if you're re-entering the workforce, you've had you know, a significant gap and now you're finally open to and eager to get back into the workforce. So with regards to functional resumes, um, Instead of focusing on, you know, your past experiences and everything, now you're focusing on the functions that you've held. So in this case, it'll allow you to shift the focus away from aspects of your background that might prevent employers from considering you, like extended gaps in your employment. Um, but be aware that most hiring managers cast a suspicious eye toward this format because they know that that's why people choose this format because there may be a gap or a lack of experience. So here you're focused on skills. What skills do you have to offer? The biggest thing right now in the market is software. What software experience do you have or exposure to? Are you, you know, quick to learn? Are you a quick study? Um, are you attentive? Or do you have that attention to detail? Now focusing more on the soft skills that you may bring to the table as well. So that's that kind of resume. And then we have the combination. So say you have some experience through school and through volunteer activities. I would consider that to be essentially, you know, work experience or relevant work experience. You would combine that and also include skills. 
So, you know, what were some of the hard technical skills that you bring to the table from school, right? From school training, extra certifications, and then your soft skills. What makes you adept to catching on to what the, the job has entailed, but yet you don't have, say, the number of years of experience they're looking for? It helps you negotiate that on paper. And that's what's really great about this format. You would use this format if um, hiring managers haven't responded to your reverse chronological resume. Um, sometimes people switch between different types just to see what works. So if chronological isn't working for you, because again, not too much experience, try this combination. If combination isn't working for you, then try functional. Okay, so resume must-haves. You're wondering, okay, what, what goes onto a resume? It's a piece of paper, yes, <laughs> but it contains very crucial information. Like I said, it only takes two minutes to make an impression of whether this hiring manager continues to read your resume or totally discards it. Um, so your resume needs to show the measurable difference you've made in previous roles. So it needs to be detailed. You need to present metrics where possible. And you know, you'll have different numbers depending on your background, but here are some sample uh, items to have on your resume. So for example, ROI, that stands for return on investment. What were some things that you have done for a company? For example, um, for me, when I was on contract with the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Alberta, um, I had reached out to uh, 600, or I had recruited 600 of the 900 candidates I reached out to. That's something that's measurable and says, wow, I even did that within a three month period. So it shows how fast paced and efficient I can work. So things like that, what was your return on investment? What was your biggest contribution to the organization? The other must have is, you know, the aesthetic of your resume making sure that it's easy to read, easy to follow. And what I found really successful with candidates and their resumes was when they had a, an organizational system almost where you have you know, the company or the organization that that work was done for. And then afterwards, the dates at which it was done for, not just the year, like specify the month. Because if it's a shorter term contract or a shorter assignment, you may only be indicating three months, but at least you were specific. Hiring managers hate it when the information on the paper is vague because then they have more questions. You want to avoid them having unnecessary questions. Um, so that's that. Um, so once you have the title of the company, the dates, what was your main contribution? So if you had a, a, had a title, say recruiter, coordinator, whatever it may be, you want to specify that. And then that's where you further organize into bullet points. So again, using those action verbs like resolved client complaints or composed um, two research studies or conducted two research studies and found that this. So organizing it in a way and having that structure on your resume will help it become visually appealing. You also wanna make sure it's error-free. I had a candidate that was being presented to one of my clients and the reason why she didn't get the job was because the hiring manager saw that, oh, they had you know one or two errors on their resume. In this role that they're hiring for, it's of utmost importance that they have that attention to detail. So if this is already happening on the resume, what else could happen? So she lost out and it was as simple as that. So you wanna make sure it's error-free. And of course you wanna display your credentials, especially if your career path is more technical, you wanna highlight what was your educational background, your training, extra certifications? Um, you wanna definitely highlight that um, on your resume. So again, what was your return on investment in the things that you did, your ROI, making sure your resume looks good, making sure it's error-free and making sure your credentials are at the top because a lot of um, you guys listening here are you know still in school or soon to be new grads or fresh out of school it's important to highlight your education because that's a strength and then couple that with any kind of relevant experience okay so now in terms of writing those bullet points that i was talking about 
you know, using those action verbs, describing what you did. Here's a nice acronym to remember, CAR, CAR statement. So what does it mean? C stands for challenge, A stands for action, R for resolution. So challenge, the conditions under which you did the work. So for example, you can say, I, you know, helped with uh, a specific project where there was this backlog of this much data. The research was behind schedule. I came in at that time and what I did was I took initiative and whatever it is you did, your action. And as a result, we were able to meet those tight deadlines. That would be your resolution. Because when you think of those bullet points, don't mistake it for a to-do list. Oh, I liaised with these professionals. I took phone calls. I sent emails. It's not a grocery list that we're doing in the bullet points. It's those action statements, those car statements of this is the environment I walked into, or this is the circumstance. This is what I did in that circumstance. And this is the result that I was able to achieve in that circumstance. That makes a strong statement, bullet point statement. Okay, so like I mentioned early on, you want to avoid saying I. The hiring manager knows this is, you're talking about yourself. So instead you wanna use, you know, action verbs like piloted, persuaded, performed, perfected, exceeded, expanded, facilitated, addressed, changed, closed, counseled, composed, developed, earned, enhanced, navigated, negotiated. There's so much um, that you can use. That's why a thesaurus and a dictionary come in handy. Um, you wanna keep those sentences short as well, right? So think of that CAR acronym, right? Challenge, action, resolution. And then using bullet points, again, when you need to, in that organizational structure of company, dates, functional role, and now the car statements. I would usually limit your bullet points to three, actually. Three bullet points, no more than three. Otherwise, that's most likely more of a grocery or to-do list, and we don't want that. All right, so now, the, the way the world works now is that resumes tend to go straight into a system. It no longer goes directly to the hiring manager or the HR team that screens and vets these resumes. And that offers some benefits for efficiency on the HR side, but also cons, because if you're not including keywords in your resume that are on the job posting, you're likely being screened out and not even given a chance to be looked at. So what I want you to do and what I found really helpful is that when you see a job posting, if you can either physically on paper or virtually digitally online, highlight keywords that you're like, okay, they're looking for someone to formulate this. They're looking someone to exceed this goal. They're looking for someone to pilot this kind of software or, or whatnot. So look for some keywords, highlight them. And then that way, because you have it highlighted, when you start to craft your resume, you can make sure when you talk, when you have those car statements in your bullet points, you can use those words exactly. And it will increase the chances of you um, making it past the system and actually in front of somebody's eyes to look at. So that's something you definitely wanna do. Um, and now in terms of customizing your resume, it's important too that you're applying to jobs that you're applicable for or that you're eligible for. So you wanna make sure you know, you're assessing job title, department, organization. The more keywords you have on your resume, the better, the more likelihood you'll pass through the system and actually come and come across somebody's real eyes to look at your paper. Um, yeah, and in terms of finding jobs, there of course is Indeed, Monster and other search engines like that. But what I'm finding a new trend is uh, Indeed. So if you create a really strong Indeed profile, treat it like almost a Facebook profile, but a professional version of that. Um, lots of recruiters are reaching out directly there. Um, and essentially your LinkedIn profile is your resume which is really cool. It's kind of like a virtual diary of, hey, this is, you know, Mira, this is, these are the accomplishments and jobs she's had. It's just very easy and a great way to, a great platform to network as well. So I would take advantage of that. Those are 
the that's one of the newer ways in terms of seeking employment. Okay, so now with regards to common questions that I get in my job, especially for new grad students or even, you know, other people who have done temporary work or contract work, they're like, is it worth putting it on my resume? And I say yes, especially if it's relevant to your ultimate career goal and helps you progress towards that. Yes, include it, even if it was only a month, even if it was only, you know, two months, three months, doesn't matter because it's relevant work experience. The more you can add, especially at this stage, the better. In terms of applying for multiple jobs with the same company, um, it's important to be discerning in where you put your resume. You never want to come across as, as desperate. Um, and then if you're applying to multiple roles with the same company is okay, as long as it makes sense. Like if you for sure would be an asset or would contribute to whatever is needed in those various roles, then it makes sense. But if you're just doing it to get noticed, don't bother because an HR person will sniff that out right away and it would not look uh, good on your behalf. So just make sure again, it's customized. And in those cases where you do apply for multiple jobs, make sure you're altering your resume because yeah, it'll look like you're just kind of trying to get attention in that case. Now with regards to appropriate resume length, people have heard lots of stuff, you know, two pages, one page, three pages. Um, we actually did a survey and 77% of senior executives polled still believe a single page is the ideal length. Yep, just a single page. So you're like, okay, what do I include then on a single page? For you guys, most likely you would highlight your education, your training and your software, so your technical background. And then you would highlight um, some skills, right? So that combined resume. So what skills are key to your field of study, key to your career that would benefit you. Highlight those, maybe, you know, four bullet points, four to eight bullet points, and then now go to your relevant work experience. Who did you help? What organization? For how long? And what did you do? Those car statements. And you can fit that in one page. Again, all you want to focus on is the most relevant experience. You know, don't try to stretch it. If it's not relevant, don't include it in your resume. And then how should you address employment gaps? Uh, so we did another survey and 93% of executives said they'd be concerned about a candidate's fit for a position if his or her resume showed involuntary periods of unemployment. So you should proactively offer a brief explanation for employment gaps in your cover letter. So this is where, you know, we'll talk about the cover letter later on in this presentation. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. With regards to gaps, it is significant and a lot of HR managers have hesitancy in hiring someone when they see that. So that's where we can address it in a cover letter. So in terms of the resume, again, what things you wanna leave out in your bullet points, right? So I talked about the car statement, the challenge, action, resolution. You wanna leave out your reason for leaving. Leave that to discuss in the interview when you're invited for the interview, uh, any personal information. And I have a star there, personal information that doesn't really need to be on a resume, like marital status, religion, political affiliation, age, hobbies, country of origin, do not include those. And then at the end, there is no need to include references available upon request. That just takes up some space, valuable space in your one pager resume. You don't need that. It's expected that if they invite you for an interview that you will be providing references to vouch for your experience and or education. Okay, so top application material blunders, things that you should be aware of. So the common mistake candidates make in their application, 39%, they include irrelevant information. So it is possible to have all relevant information in one page and 39%, you know, almost basically a third of candidates lose out on a job because they've included irrelevant information. Um, the second most common mistake is there's typos grammar, right? We always want an error-free error -free, uh, resume. The other thing is that resume is not customized. So make sure it is. 
and then we kind of go go down from there, but those are the top three that we already talked about. Okay, so now another important consideration is the logistics of getting your resume sent. The best format to use is PDF unless otherwise indicated on the job posting, and it's because the integrity and the contents of the uh, the document stay intact. Whereas if you use Word, sometimes depending on how it's uploaded or, or downloaded, it may lose its integrity. So PDF is the way to go unless otherwise indicated on the job posting. You do want to refrain from, if you are not PDFing your documents, graphics and pictures, because that can distort the layout and make it really difficult for the hiring manager to read your resume in that two minutes. Um, and you want to keep things simple. So organization format is key, but single, like choosing one font makes things easier to digest and read. All right, so cover letters, a very important step that some people often forget. Sometimes it's not required. So, you know, keep a lookout on the posting if a cover letter is required or not. If it is required, well, 78% of executives said cover letters are valuable. And this is where you can really explain whether it be a work gap, an education gap, because those are some barriers that will hinder a hiring manager from reaching out to you to interview you, right? So this is your chance to explain. One of the best cover letters I've saw, I, I've seen was only, you know, three short, short to medium paragraphs, not even that long. And it literally explained, you know, where they were at in their career, what they're hoping to achieve and explained kind of one of the weaker points on their resume. So that way, once the hiring manager looked at the resume, they already had some context and understanding of where the candidate is coming from. Okay, so the necessity of a good cover letter. So again, another good chance to make a good impression when it is required, it's the first thing that the hiring manager sees, and then your resume. Um, again, it's a way to direct attention to aspects of the resume that are likely to be a concern to the hiring manager. It also demonstrates your knowledge um, about the company you're applying to and its industry and represents, you know, the meaningful parts of your career search. And this is your opportunity to portray your personality. I know the interview is where, you know, personality and character is usually sussed out, but how are you going to do that if you don't even get a shot at the interview. So you need to emulate that in the cover letter. Okay, so for cover letter, just like writing an essay, you want to figure out what do I want to accomplish in this letter? What do I want to leave my the hiring manager feeling when they're done reading this cover letter? And then from there, that's what helps you curate what information you want to share. And again, concise is, is, be, is key. You want to be concise. Again, think about only two or three key points you want to convey, and then make sure you cover that in your cover letter. So now with regards to the body, um, again, your focus again is on, on that two to three points. And just like an essay, you want to expand, right? So here's a point you wanna make, here's the explanation for that point. And then the last sentence is usually what you want the reader to take away about that point. And this is also a great opportunity for you to tell, you know, the hiring manager qualities that you bring to the job, right? That you would, that they would otherwise be able to suss out in the interview. And yeah, so with regards to resume and cover letter, although it may seem very, you know, menial things, pieces of paper, it does make a huge difference. It's like that golden ticket for Willy Wonka. It's... <laughs> It's your gateway to your future. And you know, if you treat this seriously, you put the, the effort in to really craft a strong resume and strong cover letter, you're gonna be on your way to success. Because once you get your foot in the door, it's much easier from then on. And I can definitely speak to that <laughs> from experience. Once candidates get their first job, it's easy to get your next and then the next and then the next. So I'm very excited for you guys to be embarking on uh, real life and yeah, I'm ready for questions. Thank you so Thank much, you so that, much. Was that was very fantastic. Very fantastic. Um, um, so our so first our question, question. Uh, okay, sorry. 
Yeah. Um, so um, we have so a question that we thought about from our book, our book uh, which, uh, which is like is how like important it is to put, to put in, in skills, skills that you've that learned in labs, labs, for example, or uh, and, uh, papers and papers and things and like that like on that a resume. On resume. Hey, Mira, yeah. there's some, there's some feedback. feedback. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Let me, let me just close. Can you hear me now? Still a ton of feedback, feedback though. though. I think you are using two devices to uh, hear us. If you can close one of them, that would be fine. I'm hearing the feedback from multiple people. So I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, can, yeah, can, can, we, can stay? we stay? I'm not I'm sure. Not sure. <laughs> I can hear you fine. I don't know if I have uh, feedback. Oh, maybe oh, you maybe could like, like mute, mute maybe, maybe and then, and then after, after when you're talking. Yeah, yeah. is that better? Is that better? I think that was better. If you could mute and then like, unmute 20. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. That's <laughs> much better. Perfect. I think. <laughs> okay. So our first question was um, like, how important is it to put in uh, skills or lab techniques and things like that and, and papers uh, that you've done or that you've um, had in your resume? Yeah, for me, most of my experience recruiting and, you know, working with clients is more on the corporate office side, professional level staffing. If it is more technical, however, dependent on what you see in the job description of that job posting, for example, you may want to highlight those, say, laboratory techniques, because then they may require that from you. But at the same token, um, I think your education will say it for itself. For those bullet points with regards to skills, you know, the technical and the soft, what I've seen people highlight is kind of 50-50, especially if you are more of a junior, you know, fresh out of school candidate, focusing on those soft skills is important, right? The biggest soft skills I believe to date um, would be self-starter. That's a big one. A lot of companies are looking for people who are self-starters without a doubt. Whether that be construction, oil and gas, nanotechnology, um, health, I have clients across all the board. Self-starter is a big one. So if you want to make note of that, another um, great bullet point is saying like best in class. Because when you indicate your education in there, and if you say, hey, I'm best in class, or hey, I, you know, am top 15% of my class across all majors in this background and specialization. Well, that's kind of speaks for itself that you would be familiar with those laboratory techniques related to that industry and related to that education. Another one is accelerated career track. These are, you know, descriptors that paint a picture that you are eager, you're efficient, you're autonomous. And those are qualities that employers are looking for regardless of industry right now. Well, thank you. Uh, and one question like related to the different types of resumes, a uh, question came in to like, could you reapply for a job after a month if, they're still, if they still haven't hired with like a different format of resume? Mm. I would say no. <laughs> um, in that scenario, the next best steps to take. So say, okay, a month ago you've submitted your resume and you're like, shoot, I submitted the wrong resume. Well, for future note, Make sure your resume is curated and, and perfect to go for that. The next step that you can take is not, not resubmitting your resume, but rather figuring out who the hiring manager is. I know there's, now that LinkedIn is becoming more popular, there's LinkedIn etiquette. I would actually advise not to add this person, like the hiring manager on LinkedIn, like don't do that. That's um, not proper. But what I would do is try to figure out, is there a phone line, you know, company phone line, and you can say, can I please reach out to, I have a question with regards to the position or you know, what, what's the status at, or even reaching out directly to the hiring manager, unless otherwise, if it says 
you know, prohibited, do not call, then don't call. But if it doesn't, then you're more than happy to call as long as you're approaching it in a way of, you know, curiosity, what's happening with the role. And, you know, if you have something to say or add value, then I would make that call as well. Oh, perfect. Um, another question came from, like, if you have volunteer experience that is not really work, but it's related maybe. Uh, how, do you put that as under your work experience or what do you put that in? And yeah. if you don't have any work experience actually related to that job, is it is it still okay to just list things that you've volunteered in? A hundred percent. Yes, <laughs> without a question. Experience is experience. Whether that be, you know, from volunteering, non-paid practicum, a paid internship, it's all experience. And so what I do and what I recommend to especially my more junior candidates is to put that under one umbrella of experience. Like don't even differentiate. There is no need to. You don't have to say it's work and you don't have to say it's volunteer. Just say it's experience. <laughs> that would make sense. <laughs> um, and the other, so uh, someone asked, some application portals make uh, the candidates fill out a predefined field in the application to describe their work experience in addition to uploading the resume. Do you have any advice for filling out these kind of applications or should you just copy parts from the resume into those fields or what should you do? Or should you eliminate things from your resume if it's in those fields? Yeah, I definitely would not eliminate anything from your resume. Your resume is a separate document. Usually this is used almost as internal record keeping for companies. So for mm -hmm. me in my role as a staffing manager, yes, I do talk to candidates, but for the most part, I talk with companies day in, day out on a daily basis, 24 <laughs> seven. Um, and for them, it really is an internal method of record keeping. So as long as, again, you're still mentioning those keywords that they've indicated in their job description, and you're truly and succinctly answering the question that they have proposed, mm -hmm. you should be good. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another question is, uh, is it worth taking an extra one, half or one page to list uh, extracurricular activities along with your work experience? No. <laughs> um, so for me, when I look at resumes, um, recently I was recruiting for an HR HSC specialist. So HSC is occupational health and safety. That skill set does not exist. So of the new 200 applications, I I looked at each one maybe a minute or less. So am I going to see that second page? Probably not. <laughs> um, you want to, again, that first impression, first page, that's all that matters. Um, essentially, you would be, you can if you want to have that second page, but ideal is that one pager. And if if one of those experience, if it's something related to the job that you're doing, or it's something that you're applying for, I mean, uh, okay, so but it. sorry, sorry. Oh, if it's um related, and maybe you have an extra half a page, then yeah. Okay. And if it's what if it is like been what if it's something that I've done maybe ten years ago, or how what's the time, yeah. like how far back do you take your resume? There's lots of circumstances, but I would say the standard would be no more later than 10 years okay. back. So it should be within 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. That's the standard. Uh, we got another question for about connecting to people on LinkedIn. So is it okay to contact people who are related to the company or the post that you want to apply? Um, yeah on LinkedIn, like not necessarily the hiring manager. Mm -hmm. um, I would leverage LinkedIn. Um, say, you know, you're looking at companies to apply to. Say you haven't applied yet, right? You're looking at companies that you're interested in and you want to learn more about, hey, you know, I want to pursue a career that you have. Um, would you be open to an informational interview? I feel like it's worthwhile leveraging LinkedIn that way to get a sense of, okay, is this a role I want to pursue first and foremost? And secondly, what are key things that you do in your role? Because now I know key things I have to highlight in order to potentially um, pipeline myself into that kind of position. Like I would use it for more of like a, an information tool, mm -hmm. not so much of an, because it almost sounds like an investigator. If you, you applied, 
and you're like, okay, I'm not going to reach out to the direct hiring manager who I may or may not know, but let me reach out to everyone else in HR who may not be working on this job. It just doesn't look good because people talk, people talk right. with each other. Um, and I had a circumstance where a candidate, unfortunately, again, LinkedIn is becoming more and more popular and etiquette is slow, just like law is slow to catch up to develop, you know, protocols and, and etiquette, but she had added my, my client on LinkedIn and my client did not receive that well. My client actually right. said that it seemed like your candidate was trying to get an unfair advantage by adding me on LinkedIn. So you just don't want to create false or bad impression. <laughs> so refrain right. from doing it if you are applying to a job. Oh, that's, yeah, that's really interesting to know. Um, yep. So someone asked, um, for an educational resume, should it be one to two pages too? Or is it, it is mostly more or something, right? Like, yeah, so educational resumes, I'm not familiar with the term, I'm not sure. I'm not familiar either. Would you be able to clarify? Um, yeah, for whoever posted the question, if you could clarify yeah. and then we can take it like, back. What is your background and what kinds of jobs are you applying to? That should give me a good hint as mm -hmm. to. I think we'll take a different question till uh, someone clarifies. So uh, another question came, I have an exemplar resume that includes few sentences that describes yourself. Uh, should this be omitted and included in the CV instead? And along those lines, I like, what's the distinction? Like, uh, is like the resume, the distinction between resumes and CVs and what you should include in either? Yeah, resumes and CVs. So like the curriculum vitae, right? The Two yeah. separate things. The, the CVs are much longer. Um, and it's because I, I see more CVs when it comes to careers in academia, right? Yeah. If you're wanting to become a professor or really have a strong career as a scientist, a researcher, a research analyst, that's where it does count. And like you almost want to document every single piece of research, paper you've published, experience in the laboratory. Like that makes sense. That's where you would have multiple pages, but still again, only relevant mm -hmm. information, publications, documents, resumes, resumes are different. Um, I would say for resumes, it's to get a job outside of academia, short and sweet. I feel like that's, <laughs> that's where the distinction is. Um, and I think that actually answers the previous question. So the previous question, I think it was talking about a PhD position. And mm -hmm. I feel that's where a CV would work for you more than a resume. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Uh, so uh, one question, actually, that's interesting. Uh, so what's the best resume you've ever seen? Uh, is there something in particular or a resume in particular that you were really impressed by? And what about it that stood out the most? Yeah, I would say, especially in my area of specialization in administration and HR across industry, when I look at junior candidates, the, again, clarity of this is their name, this is their educational background, this is when they graduated or completed that educational background. And now this is their most recent experience. Again, most of their recent experience is unpaid practicums or volunteer experience, but they again, just state it as experience. And then they are specific to, you know, they have this structure where they at the very top highlight, okay, this is the organization they worked with. This is the time frame at which they worked with the organization. So say March, six to March 6, 2020 to April 6, 2020. Oh, it's only a month, but it looks good and it's very organized. I have no questions. I'm not bothered because I have no questions. <laughs> and then you go down from that and say, what was their position? Oh, their position was, you know, administrative assistant. Okay, now what were their three key bullet points, right? So the acronym CAR, what was the challenge? So in one case, you know, there was a backlog of 150 action requests that this candidate needed to work through um, within a month periods of time. And this person completed it earlier than the one month. And that one bullet point alone, you're like, wow, do I even need to read the rest of the resume? Like, I want to consider this candidate. So just being very strategic and organized is important. 
that's what makes it really good. Yeah, and that's actually really great because it's, it's, it's interesting to know what stands out and what doesn't stand out in the resume. Uh, with that, like someone asked, uh, if sometimes when a position is posted, you want to talk to people, you want to do more research on the company and more research on the job before applying. Uh, so waiting or having that delay, uh, what's an acceptable delay to an apply for a job when it's posted and how long is it okay uh, mm -hmm. to keep that process and what do you prioritize? Do you prioritize first applying for the job or researching the role first and then apply for the job? Yeah, um, I would say researching the job. So if I'm being honest about the recruitment process, the traditional recruitment process, it takes six to 12 weeks to secure yeah. one person for a job at hand. And usually it's within that first week of applications that you wanna make sure you're in there because now the hiring team, HR at the organization has already looked at a lot of resumes at that point. So any other additional ones that happen a week after that one week threshold are, uh, what do they term it? Breadcrumbs or backups, just in case the first batch didn't go well. So yes, you wanna do your research, but as long as you submit it within that first week, you're okay. Um, and usually um, after that one week of accepting resumes, usually the next week is when you expect to hear of whether you're invited for an interview. And then if you don't hear back, you're likely not invited for an interview. So I would continue pushing forward and looking at other jobs than just waiting to hear back. And how much follow-up should you be doing when it comes to resumes? and follow up with the company and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to harass the HR or whoever's hiring. And I've seen that on my end. Um, it's not pleasant and it puts a bad taste almost, almost mm -hmm. to your disadvantage. So a healthy amount of follow up would be, like I said, with that timeline of, okay, they're looking at applications within a week. After that one week, if you don't hear back, that's when I would kind of, you know, send another email and say, you know, wondering what the status of the job is. I'm very interested in this role. I feel I have, I have a lot to offer because of this, this, and this, you know, please let me know. Just very, mm -hmm. you know, not, because I've seen some candidates where maybe they come across a little bit entitled and they say, you know, I'm looking for work. Um, what's happening with this job? That doesn't come across right. <laughs> yeah. People do it. And I just want to make sure none of you do it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so in, along those lines of the timeline, should you then try to apply for a job that's over two weeks or have been posted for over two weeks or a month old, or should you not mm -hmm. bother, I guess? Yeah. At that point, I feel like it would be more strategic for you to, at that point, you can connect with the person on LinkedIn because it's been long enough. So you're assuming that you know, I, I may have been unsuccessful in a previous role, but curious to learn more about the organization, would love to connect with you, sir, madam, on LinkedIn. At that point, I feel like it's okay. Mm -hmm. Not when, you know, the resume submitted fresh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so another one is a highlight of qualification sections needed for a resume. Highlights of qualifications. Depending, I don't know, depending on what's required, say in a job posting, and if you want to make it super explicit, it's okay to have that. And it would be like right under your education. So say they're looking for this many years of experience and experience with the software and maybe a post-secondary education, as long as you have it kind of encompassed in one area and it's not too busy or too complicated, then that's okay. But I don't really, it doesn't really matter for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually I see more of that um, summary when someone has a lot of experience. Say, you know, I have a candidate who is an accounting payroll professional for so many years. Instead of having, you know, that one pager and the person thinking, oh, this person only has this many years of experience, especially if they've gone through career changes. In your highlight line, you can say, okay, this many years of experience, and then just highlighting the most recent in that one page. And then like a final thing. So for the final question is, what's the one, one thing that you would say to new graduates 
about applying for jobs and about doing the resumes like yeah. one advice one last advice i guess <laughs> so much so if you guys want to connect with me on linkedin um it's andrea dio campo if you want to learn more about robert half we're a really great resource in terms of that one piece of advice um it would be to not be lazy take action <laughs> your future is in your hands literally and you know one of the easiest ways forward and your you know ticket to a career of job after job or you know lots of opportunities is having a strong resume strong resume and cover letter put the effort i know you're like oh my gosh i worked all the, these many years for school trust me i did too i have two degrees my bachelor of science and my master of science from the university of alberta <laughs> we we put all this effort into school so why waste it now right mm -hmm. showcase like yes hey i do have my degree and this is the relevant experience i've gained now let's let me get a job and let's let's yeah carry on with the future <laughs> so just put in that last effort <laughs> Thank you so much for for that great presentation and for answering those questions. Thank you so much. We've learned so much. So I'd like to thank you, of course, for agreeing to be with us today here today. And thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And I'd also like to thank Bio Alberta for partnering with us, partnering with us on this uh, series of events. They've uh, been very, very helpful and very, very supportive to our group. Um, and with that, I'd also like to thank our over 70 volunteers from all across Canada uh, and, of course, our sponsors uh, for 2020 and 2021. Thank you all and thank you all for attending today. Um, and with that, I'd like to mention that our next event is going to be on the 18th. It's also a Setup for Success series, uh, and we're going to be talking more about interview skills. So um, register for that and, uh, and we'll be happy to see you again uh, during that event. Uh, I'd like to thank our team again for putting together this event. And um, this is our website. So please feel free to um, email us and uh, join us on LinkedIn and other social media. Thank you all for attending today. And we hope you learned something today. Thank you.